screener, and the departure is when the ball handler is moving past the screener. And our features are essentially trying to represent the interactions between the four participants in each half. So we have features that represent the velocity of players in relation to each other, and features that represent how far away they are from each other. Uh, in order to create our set of labeled data, we had to go through games and record every time an on-ball screen occurred. It was myself and one undergraduate, undergraduate researcher, Matt Redfield, doing this work, and we randomly selected 21, game, 21 quarters from 14 games, and nine teams were represented in that data set. So the actual labeling step was to look at each action and decide if that action was a pick and roll, and if so, we'd assign it a label of plus one, uh, which in this case, it clearly is an action, and if it's not a, uh, it is a screen, and if it's not a screen, we assign it a label of negative one. So we need labeled data to both train the classifier on and to test the classifier on. So uh, we did a 50-50 split between the training data and testing data, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details uh, later on in this talk. Now that we have these actions represented by a feature vector, it's time to learn the model. Uh, we have all these labeled data points that we went through and uh, labeled, as I had mentioned earlier, and we learned a classifier to separate actions that are screens from actions that aren't screens. The model we used is called a soft margin support vector machine, and we used a linear kernel. Essentially what this model does is it takes your feature vector and it maps it to a scalar value that is indicative of how likely it is that this action is an on-ball screen. The greater the value of the scalar, the more likely it is to be an on-ball screen. Uh, and now comes the classification step. But before we go into too much detail of that, we want to talk about how you can measure classifier performance. And there's a lot of different ways to measure how accurate a classifier is, but I'll, quit, I'll briefly give a description of the three uh, measures we used. Sensitivity is essentially how many of the on-ball screens that exist did you correctly classify. Specificity is uh, how many of the non-on-ball screens did you correctly classify as not being on-ball screens. And positive predictive value is the likelihood that if you label something as an on-ball screen, it actually is an on-ball screen. Essentially, how confident are you in your labels? Now, the classification depends on your decision threshold that you set. So let me explain this diagram a little bit. Uh, essentially, you have actions mapped to scalar values represented on this number line. And the red dots indicate actions that are actually pick and rolls, and the blue dots represent actions that are not pick and rolls. Uh, you set a decision threshold, in this case zero, and everything that has a scalar value larger than that decision threshold is classified as an on-ball screen. Everything with a lower scalar value is classified as not being an on-ball screen. And in this case, um, your sensitivity is 75% because you're correctly labeling three out of the four red dots. Your specificity is 80% because you're correctly labeling four out of the five blue dots. And your positive predictive value is 75% because of the four things you're classifying as on-ball screens, Three of them are actually on-ball screens. However, you can shift this decision value, this decision threshold, to get a trade-off between these different measures of accuracy. So if you move the decision threshold up to four, you're increasing your specificity because you're now correctly labeling all of the blue dots. You're also increasing your positive predictive value because everything that you've called an on-ball screen actually is an on-ball screen. However, there's a hit in sensitivity because you're now incorrectly labeling more of the on-ball screens, and it's only, the sensitivity is only 50%. So uh, there's a curve called the receiver operating characteristic curve that shows the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity in a graphical form. On one axis, you have sensitivity, and on the other axis, you have one minus specificity. And you can use area under this ROC curve, abbreviated as AUROC, as a single number <laughs> excuse me, as a single number indicating how well your classifier performs. So an AUROC indicates that your classifier performs perfectly, and an AUROC of 0 0.5 indicates that your classifier is no better than random. Uh, one sec. So now let's transition into what we actually accomplished in our research. We built three different types of classifiers. The first, the global classifier is a single classifier for use on all of our teams, and it's trained on data from all nine teams that we have data for. Uh, we also created a set of team-specific classifiers, which is one classifier per team trained only on that team's data. Finally, we created what we call augmented team-specific classifier, 
which are still one classifier per team, but instead of being trained only on that team's data, it's trained on a set of teams that are similar to that team. And I'll explain a little bit more about how we discovered similarity further into this slide. Uh, so the global classifier. The first step in creating the global classifier was deciding on our training set. And we really had two conditions that we had to satisfy. The first is because we wanted to use this classifier on all of our, the different teams, we wanted each team to be equally represented in the training set. The second uh, thing we had to deal with was that we want our training data to be representative of the total set of data. And in our full set of actions, 50% of them are positive and 50% of them are negative. So in our training set, we wanted half of the actions to be positive and half of them to be negative. To that end, we chose 14 positive actions and 14 negative actions from each team for a total of 252 training points. Uh, and for our testing set, we chose 13 positive and 13 negative actions for a total of 234 training points. Now, to ensure that some random split of data didn't mislead us and give us a too good result or a too poor result, we repeated the experiment 200 times with different uh, splits of training testing data. And then, in order to find the performance, we averaged the AUROC over all those trials. The AUROC that we got was uh, 0.83 with a standard deviation of 0.085. And we've also plotted the ROC curve here. Uh, but what exactly does this tell us? AUROC is really useful when you're trying to compare classifiers, but if you look at an AUROC of 0.83, it doesn't really tell you how useful this classifier is. So we also looked at the sensitivity positive predictive value curve, and here we've highlighted one of the highest utility points, which is a sensitivity of 82% and a positive predictive value of 80%. Essentially what this is saying is our classifier can identify 82% of all on-ball screens, and when we identify something as an on-ball screen, we are 80% confident that our identification is correct. Now, this seems like a fairly useful classifier. However, we realized that teams run the pick and roll very differently from each other, so we wondered if we might be better off creating one classifier individually for each team. Uh, to that end, we created a set of team-specific classifiers trained only on one team's data. Uh, and in order to make a fair comparison to a one-size-fits-all classifier, we created a global classifier where we control for the number of data points. And as you can see, in each case, the team-specific classifier outperforms the global classifier. And this is not exactly shocking, but this does show that variation between teams is likely hurting performance of our big global classifier. However, the limiting factor here is the amount of labeled data we have again. 28 data points is just not very much when you're trying to train a classifier. Um, and by limiting ourselves to data from only a single team, are we potentially ignoring useful data from other teams? What if we could increase the size of our training set by creating groups of teams that are similar? However, similarity is a very challenging thing to define. So what we've done here is we took each team-specific classifier and applied it to each team's test set. And we postulated that if a, t a classifier trained on Boston data performs really well on Golden State Warriors, you can say that Boston is similar to Golden State. So in order to look at similarity, we examine each row uh, and then we sort by performance. So if we were to look at the example of Golden State, we look at each team-specific classifier's performance on the Golden State test set, and then we sort by performance in order to determine which team is most similar. So in this case, Golden State is most similar to itself, and then Boston, followed by Chicago and Houston, and at the very bottom, Portland is the least similar. And while this gives us a little bit of idea of which teams are similar, it still leaves the question of how many teams should we actually include for these augmented team-specific classifiers. Essentially, when does the disadvantage of dissimilar data outweigh the advantage of just having more training data? In order to test that, we created nine different size classifiers for each team. We created a nine-team classifier, which is trained on 28 data points from each of the nine teams, and this is the same as the global classifier we discussed at the very beginning. We then removed the least similar team, which in this case is Portland, to create our eight-team classifier, and that is trained on 28 data points from each of the eight teams that are most similar to Golden State. We then continue to remove the least similar team one by one until we're left with a classifier trained on only a single team, and this classifier is trained on 28 data points from Golden State. Um, this is the performance of those classifiers. 
Now, in general, you see a very strong correlation between the size of your training set and the performance with a larger size of a training set leading to much better performance. Uh, so that would mean you would expect to see this uh, being the best performance and then a steady downward trend to the single team classifier having the worst performance. However, what's interesting is in, for each team, you find the peak is actually in the middle of these sets. And this is a very surprising result, uh, especially because most of these peaks are somewhere around a 50% reduction in data set. And what this indicates is that we can actually create a better performing classifier using less data by leveraging the dissimilarity between teams. So just to quickly summarize what we've managed to create in our research, we have a global classifier that was trained on a lot of varied data and a, large, a fairly large amount of data, but we believe that dissimilarity between teams hurt the performance of this classifier. We then built a set of team-specific classifiers that were trained on very specific data, and while conceptually this seems like it is the best approach, the small amount of data means that the performance is much worse than the global classifier. Finally, we created this augmented team-specific classifiers where we combined very specific data with a larger quantity of data, and we found the performance is better than either the team-specific or the global classifiers. And while these are really encouraging results, there are some limitations we need to point out. The first is that we're working with a very small amount of data. As I said, only myself and one other, one other undergraduate researcher was, were doing the labeling. So while watching basketball is probably the most fun job I've ever had to do, it's still very time consuming, and so we had very limited amounts of data, and we'd prefer to have much larger amounts of data. Another point was when we were determining the rule-based criteria for creating actions, the data segmentation algorithm, we made sure that each on-ball screen correlated to an action. However, we did not make sure that it was a one-to-one -one correlation, so potentially double screens and staggered screens could be grouped together in a single action and so considered a single on-ball screen by our system. Uh, and finally, as it was just me and an undergrad labeling, uh, we were using our best judgment as to what an on-ball screen was, and so there was probably an implied definition of an on-ball screen, and we can probably debate whether or not that definition was correct. Um, so this is basically what we've accomplished in our system. And we think most of the innovation happened in the data segmentation and feature extraction steps. And while this system is not perfect, uh, you can think of it as more of a proof of concept, and there's multiple avenues we can develop. Uh, the first is that this system can be a, build, uh, excuse me, be a building block for more sophisticated analysis into the pick and roll. For example, we believe that uh, with a little bit more development, we might be able to find out what exactly makes a pick and roll successful. And secondly, this work really is a framework for an, a new set of tools that will make video inspection easier, faster, and better. Uh, this work is really just the beginning of what we can do when we combine machine learning techniques and this pattern recognition uh, and this player tracking data. Thank you. Okay, so now for the Q&A section, I'd like to invite my co-authors up onto the stage. Um, if you have a question, please line up in the aisle to the right, or to your left. Uh, I noticed that when you were doing the single team classifiers and comparing them on each team, it looked like you had some cases where uh, a team performed better on another team's classifier by itself as opposed to just itself. So I was wondering if you had like, what your thoughts on, on that were? Um, so we believe that's just a byproduct of the training data we had. Some teams run their pick and rolls very consistently and we believe that leads to a better classifier. We have not done that much research into why this is and it definitely is an interesting finding that we'd like to pursue further. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is it may not be teams are the right thing to focus on, but rather personnel groups, since the same team may run their pick and roll quite differently depending who's on the floor. Hey, uh, thanks for the analysis. That was uh, very interesting. Um, the question I have is um, you mentioned the, the lack of training data used, and I'm really curious how these classifiers will hold up with more training data. Uh, so one of the thoughts I had was SynergySports.com that provides all the pick and roll Maybe as opposed to you and another undergrad going through all the game tape, you could uh, just use that for maybe more bigger training sets. So 
curious your thoughts of how you think these classifiers will uh, perform with uh, more training data. I'd love to answer that question. Um, more data, the better. Uh, so I think that these classifiers can only get better with uh, more labeled data. Thanks, nice talk. I was curious if um, you think you had enough samples to draw very strong conclusions about similarities between teams. It could just be the randomness of the, of the sample size that leads you to conclude that one team was similar to another, whereas if you looked at more players, more teams, more games, you might conclude that the other teams could run similar style of pick and rolls, for example. Um, so yes, this is definitely an issue that we faced. But we believe that um, that final graph I showed, where you see peaks in the middle, using this technique to identify similar teams, suggests that while our measure might not be perfect, it is effective at uh, finding a good subset, a subset of training data. So this is a super technical question, and I apologize everyone else. Um, but I guess why the choice of a linear kernel over a nonlinear one, or something that might be more predictive? Uh, you know, could you speak to that? Yes, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so we chose to use a linear kernel uh, to preserve some of the interpretability of the classifier. Um, with a linear classifier, we get a weight for every single one of the features. So there are, it's a very complex um, relationship among the features, so that's why we binarized all the features, and the feature space ends up being 150 dimensions, um, which is actually quite high. Uh, Armand, do you want to talk about the really important features that you found? Um, yeah, we did a little bit of work into this, not too much, but we found that the separation created between the ball handler and the on-ball defender is a very strong indicator of an on-ball screen. Uh, the screener moving away from the basket during the approach half is a very strong indicator. Um, yeah, so we learned a little bit from that, uh, but we need to do more yeah. research. The other thing to say is, is that using a nonlinear classifier, you can always get a better fit to the training data, usually. Uh, they tend not to generalize as well, because there's a real risk, particularly when you don't have enough points, that you overfit to the data. Finally, we do manage in the way the features are constructed to incorporate some nonlinear aspects by looking at combinations of things in the actual feature construction process. So from a technical point of view, you can often do pretty well with a linear classifier and careful feature construction, rather than resorting to the uh, nonlinear classifiers, which have a lot of problems. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have left for questions, so thank you very much.